Hello there. Um, uh, thank you very much for joining us on today's event, uh, which is um, on publishing in translation studies, reflections of an editor, referee and author. And uh, you're very welcome to the virtual Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. We run many events out of Dublin on translation studies, on translation practice and on the translation profession. And uh, um, in this event, we're going to uh, hear of course, about publishing and translation studies. And you're very welcome to take part. We, uh, this is not a lecture in the classic sense. It's an interactive lecture. So um, if you have comments or questions that you'd like to make, please type them into the chat box. Uh, please don't turn on your microphone because um, this will slow down the whole event, but you're very welcome to type uh, things into the chat box at any point. You don't have to wait until the end. But we will leave the last few minutes to specifically address questions that have come up. And I think Roberto will also be addressing them as you type them as well. So uh, without any further ado, I will pass over to Roberto who can um, uh, kick us off. So thanks so much. Uh, well, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, James, for the invitation. Let me share my Okay. Um, thanks very much, James, for the invitation to be here with you, with all of you today. Um, this is something a bit awkward, but I think we're getting accustomed to it. Uh, we've been doing it for uh, quite a few months. Um, I can see a few names that I recognize that uh, have joined us uh, today. I, I've seen Vina Tesser and some other names that uh, I'm familiar with. Uh, we have corresponded over the past uh, few years, so I'm, I'm very glad that uh, so many people um, uh, have joined us and also uh, welcome to all, all the other people that I don't know that we hope to perhaps get to know each other in the future at some point. Now, um, what I would like to, uh, to, uh, to do today is, as uh, James just, just mentioned, um, it's not the traditional type of uh, um, session in which I talk for 40 minutes and then you ask a number of questions or my comments. If you, um, if along the way you have any comments or any questions and you want to intervene at any time, you are more than welcome. So the, the slides that I have prepared um, for you today are more an excuse to talk rather than anything else. Um, so uh, the, the general title would be Publishing in Translation Studies. Um, in the you know, previous slide, the one Jane shared, all reflections as editor, uh, editor of free and also uh, author. Um, I've been working in this um, thing for about 30 years now, now so I have uh, quite a lot of experience, experiences to share with you. I would need probably about three weeks to do uh, so. Um, but I will try to uh, just mention a couple of things that perhaps could be of interest. And then from there, we can move on if, if you want. Now, uh, let's start, um, okay, with my first slide. Uh, it, here, what I'm sharing is um, two pictures of the two um, collections, the periodical and the collection, the book collection that I edit. I, I have the honor to edit. Uh, the case of Perspectives, I've been the editor-in-chief for about 10 years now. I was co-editor before, so I've had some experience editing this journal, um, as you can imagine. And also the Benjamin's Translation Library, which is probably the most prestigious trans, uh, translation studies uh, book series um, at the moment. Uh, as you probably know, that was uh, first uh, edited by uh, Gideon Touris, so it's, it's, it was really a, a great honor when uh, Benjamin's contacted me to uh, follow in his footsteps. And these are two very diff different publications, as you can imagine. Uh, we're dealing, the one case with periodical, uh, we publish articles, in the case of Benjamin's, we publish, publish books, we publish monographs, we, we publish edited collections. So they don't work ex exactly in the same way. Um, I will be probably focusing more on perspectives, but I also wanted to share with you uh, some insights into the, the way uh, the Benjamin's Translation uh, Library and other similar collections work. 
And we normally publish about seven, eight uh, edited collections or monographs every year. Uh, whereas in the case of, uh, you know, a periodical like perspectives, we publish about 50, uh, 50 60 uh, articles, 60 papers per year. Um, also in the case of the Benjamin's translation library, we receive fewer, as you can imagine, fewer proposals around maybe 20 per year. Um, those uh, proposals are then refereed by, uh, or at least the proposals are, 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 are checked by me first, and then a couple of people will also have a look at them from my editorial team, and they will also have a say in whether we should go ahead with the, the, the publication of this, uh, or, or at least with the projects as such. And then the, the books themselves, the monographs, the edited collections are also refereed by two experts, the whole monograph. Uh, which I think is, is rather unique in, in when we're talking about book collections often in other, uh, uh, with other publishers, you tend to submit a proposal and then only uh, the proposal is, is refereed. In the case of the Benjamin's translation library, uh, two referees will read the whole uh, manuscript before it is uh, finally accepted. So um, 20 proposals, we published about eight of those uh, proposals. Um, I don't know whether you have any comments or any questions about this, uh, in particular about the Benjamin's Translation Library. Uh, if you do, uh, you're welcome to type it in and I will try to deal with that. If not, I will move on to perspectives. And um, one of the things that when James contacted me, uh, I think it was in the summer, um, uh, about you know joining you or uh, organizing this, this event, uh, one of the things that he mentioned was that uh, whenever uh, he discusses or they discuss uh, so, uh, publishing in translation studies or publishing in translation studies journals, um, young scholars particularly are not very familiar with, the, with, the, uh, with the, the way in which this works. And sometimes they get frustrated, uh, sometimes desperate for a number of reasons. And uh, what James says, well, they don't realize the way usually, and you know, a, a journal like perspectives or the translator or meta or target or any of those top uh, journals uh, work. So what I want to do is uh, share with you um, the reasons why sometimes you may get frustrated uh, as it were. Now, I said for the Benjamin's translation library, we normally receive about 20 proposals. In the case of a journal like perspectives, uh, normally we get uh, between 300 and 400 papers per year. Uh, you can imagine the bulk, you can imagine the work, the amount of work that that means. Um, this means that also uh, that we have to reject many more papers that, uh, than perhaps we would like to reject, or we, we would like to publish more than we actually publish. We publish 50, 60, we, probably there will be uh, a, another, um, say 50, 60 that could be publishable at some point, that have potential to be published at some point, but we can't. Uh, we don't have en enough slots. So what that means that uh, whatever we accept uh, must meet a number of requirements. And one of these requirements is that um, the, the, the work that is published, the article that is published has an international appeal that it will appeal to our international readership. That is not just something that you can uh, write for your local audience or your national audience. Um, why is that important? Because as you know, uh, in the case of a, a journal like Perspectives, uh, we depend very much on citations in order to be indexed in uh, things like Thomson Reuters uh, Arts and Humanities, Humanities Citation Index or the Social uh, Sciences Citation Index in the European, uh, European SJR or in the European Reference Index for the Humanities. Now, in an article that I published, uh, I think it was last year, about uh, publishing in translation studies, that was a special issue of uh, Perspectives, uh, edited by four colleagues from uh, Scandinavia, from the Nordic countries. Uh, I, I mentioned, I, I quoted this particular, these authors, and they, meant, they said, I, th I think this is important, that um, these indexes uh, are usually responsible for the most perverse effects of bibliometrics driven science policy as impact factors appear to be more erratic that, than stock exchange indexes. Now, they're right uh, in the sense that very often this, uh, when you look at rankings of uh, journals, if you look at the impact factors, they tend to go like this. 
And this is what they're talking about, this, this erratic nature of these uh, uh, rankings. And why do they go like this? Why do they have these spikes and then down and then up again? Uh, because from year from year, we depend on citations and they will take into account the citations of the previous year. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we tend to go for research that is good quality, but at the same time will appeal to, to international readers that will be cited and therefore are, uh, uh, um, are, are, are uh, JCR uh, index, it goes up rather than down. So this is one of the reasons why we tend to go for international readership, uh, uh, international um, scholarship or a scholarship that appeals to international uh, readership. Now, um, to give you an idea, uh, this is the, the, the impact factors of the main uh, TS journals are very similar. This is uh, this year's, corresponds to last year, obviously, but this is this year's uh, impact factors. And uh, if you look at three of the top 10 uh, perspectives, target and the translator, the impact factor is very similar. Uh, the three of them are, uh, these three uh, journals are uh, in fact general journals, so we publish on anything from interpreting to literary translation or the visual translation and so on. And the, the impact factor is very similar, around 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0 0.48, 56. So very similar. It's very low if you compare it with other uh, disciplines, if you compare it with chemistry. But the fact that we are there is already a good sign. Why is it a good sign? Uh, because this is where, uh, this is the SJR, is the other, uh, the, the previous impact factors that I share with you uh, are JCR, Thomson Reuters. This is uh, the SJR. They have different sections and subsections. And this is a little bit the evolution of perspectives over the past 20 years. Now, um, you see different colors and these colors uh, signify the uh, quartiles where we have been placed over the past 20 years. Now, originally uh, perspectives was red or orange. Uh, red meant the fourth, uh, orange meant the third uh, quartile. Uh, and then as you move into the, uh, the last decade, um, I, I took over for you to, you know, to uh, realize where we're talking, what we're talking about in 2011. So that's when I took over the editorship. And at that time we were in the third quartile more or less. Uh, we move up to the second, back into the fourth, then uh, up again into the second. And for the past five years, we've been green. So it's been uh, a bit of a, uh, a race uh, as we're. And we've been green for the past five years. In, in 2019, we have, uh, traditionally we were in the linguistics and language section of the social sciences. Uh, this year we have been included in all these, in these four, including cultural studies, and also language and linguistics of uh, the arts and humanities uh, section. So, um, four, the first quartile for this year, and in the case of literature and literary theory, uh, we are in number 12 out of almost 900 journals. So as you can imagine, this is good news for the general uh, and also for the, for the authors who publish in uh, perspectives. Here you have a summary of what I've just said. In the case of uh, literature, literary theory, 12 out of almost 900. The next one in literature and literary theory is a, a, a less known translation studies journal uh, called Skase. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's published in uh, Slovakia. And in between there's, there's nothing, there's no translation studies. If you go to language and linguistics, of course, there are many more there. These are the top six. Uh, on, in, we have again uh, around 900 journals, and these six uh, TS journals are in the first uh, quartile as well. So, why is this uh, important? Well, uh, because basically we live in a publish and perish um, uh, academic world, publish or perish. I, I, I've uh, redefined this as publish fast or perish. It wasn't like that when I started back in the 1990s. You, you needed to publish, but not as much and as often as, as, as many public, you didn't have to have as many articles or as many publications as young scholars need now for uh, promotion purposes or even for hiring purposes. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we tend to get so many submissions. Uh, universities, uh, ministers of education, departments of education, 
they tend uh, to ex expect uh, researchers, academics to publish in very specific journals, which means that when I, when I took over the editorship of a journal 10 years ago, we would receive maybe about 60 uh, papers per year. We only publish about uh, 20 uh, at that time, 20, 30 papers. So about 50% of the, of the uh, submissions eventually made it into the, into the journal, 50%, which is not bad. Um, however, although the, the number of issues has increased uh, and also the page budget has increased, uh, we moved from four, um, four issues per year, publishing four articles per issue to six issues per year, publishing about nine, 10 per uh, issue. Uh, we now receive about 350 or four, between 350 and 400 submissions a year. So you, as you can see, it's a huge number of papers. Uh, and we can only pu publish between 50 and 60, as, as I said before. This means that uh, um, we can accept around 20, 22%. Depends very much on, on you know, it's, it's for a 12 year period. So we, if we check regularly, that, that, that figure will change as well. But it's something between 20, 21, 23, four, uh, no more than 25%. Um, we publish about two or three special issues a year. Uh, and this, this is, uh, you have to realize that some, some of these issues are, uh, are um, planned well in advance. Uh, sometimes we have call for papers because the, the, the guest editors uh, issue a call for papers. It's in, other, in other cases, what they do is they gather a number of specialists and uh, they propose a special issue. So that, that is closed and say that um, you could not have access to that particular call of papers because there is no call, uh, call for papers. Um, in any case, both ordinary issue papers and special issue papers, even those that are outside, say, the, the general system, are refereed by at least two experts, at least. And this is important. Uh, let me just check. Um, yeah. Uh, at least two, uh, and as, as I said, this is important uh, um, because it, it will help us understand you know, the whole procedure. Um, sometimes authors get a bit anxious about, you know, what you get, you submit a paper and we, you, you're waiting there for a few months and then you, you, have, you haven't heard from us. Now, this to some extent is a good sign um, because that means that, that we have initiated the, the refereeing process. If you uh, hear from us almost right away, uh, within one or two weeks, this is not so good because that means that the paper has been rejected, desk rejected. Uh, the co-editors and myself have decided that we will not proceed with uh, the refereeing process. Why? For a number of reasons. Uh, we can perhaps uh, discuss them later if, if you want. If you haven't heard for uh, quite a few weeks, for two, three months, uh, th this means that the process, the process has started. Now, uh, that means that very often, uh, if, if you're lucky, uh, and, and uh, the, we invite a couple of referees, the, if the referees are available and willing to refer the paper, then the process will start. But that doesn't mean that they will do it within one month. Sometimes it will require more time. And if they need more time, this means that obviously uh, your reports will get to us much later. Now, this is in the, uh, say, mo most optimistic uh, situation, but what can also happen is that we contact one referee and they will decline. And then the next one and they will decline. And then the next one and they will decline. And then the next one and the next one and the next one, up to eight, nine or 10 people. And that takes time. So if we start almost right away contacting referees, doesn't mean that we will receive um, uh, their, their replies right away. Sometimes we have to wait one week before they actually reply. So once again, that makes the process much longer. It might be uh, two months before we actually have two referees willing to review your paper. So that will make the process uh, pretty long. You're lucky, the two, uh, the two uh, referees, the two initial referees accept and they, uh, they submit the reports right away. Uh, the re reports are, say, positive for the most part. They recommend revisions. Uh, this will mean that prob uh, probably within four or five months, the whole process may be completed. Four or five months, if you're lucky. But again, this is not 
the usual uh, time span. Usually we're talking more in terms of 10, 12 months, in some cases even uh, longer. Now, another issue, uh, we talked about at least two referees. Um, I mentioned that this is important because sometimes I'm, I might get a, re a report that is, um, say, useless. Um, the referee will say, I don't like this, uh, this particular article. There are far too many uh, issues with it, but they don't provide any particular uh, suggestions. What happens, happens in this case is that I would have to contact another referee. So <clears throat> that again will mean that the process will be longer. Um, another common situation, unfortunately, is that the two referees don't agree. Uh, one will recommend publication after revisions the other one might, might say, well, this paper cannot be published, uh, so re rejection. Now, what happens in these cases, uh, if I am I'm familiar with the topic, I can make a decision. So say, if, I, if uh, the topic of the paper is uh, news translation, I'm familiar with that. This is one of the areas uh, of, of research uh, I work with. So I could make a decision based on those two reports. Now imagine that uh, the topic of the paper is um, interpreting. Now I have no, I, I, I used to work as an interpreter 30 years ago, but I have done no research into interpreting. This is not my area of specialization. I need a third of referee in that case. So even if I have two reports and are useful, I will still have to contact a third referee and the process will continue. The refereeing process will continue for maybe another month, another two months. So there are no, um, no specific uh, time spans that we can discuss. We can, uh, we can, actually, uh, can actually tell you. Now, this, these are general statistics from yesterday. Uh, I can check that every, every day, basically, every minute if, you, if I want to. Uh, I want you to focus on the second column rather than the first one, which is not relevant for us. Now, the second column, you can see the, the average turnaround time, right? Now, if you look at it, those are days. So all those average uh, turnaround times uh, are around a month. But you have to, uh, again, you have to bear in mind that you need to take into account all the papers that are uh, rejected right away. So on the same day, the day after they are submitted. So they're not, they're not realistic uh, turnaround times. Uh, it's true that if you look at it, you say average, average days from submission to first decision and the average day, uh, average, uh, day is, uh, is around 37, uh, 36.9, 37 days. Now, that includes, uh, as I said, uh, papers that were rejected right away. But then you also have to bear in mind that there will be papers that were not, that were, uh, you know, it took maybe four, five, six months before I could make a first decision based on the referee's reports. Now, if you look at the final uh, figure, 38 days from submission to final decision, 38 days, you would say this is not, again, a very long period, a very long waiting period, and, and it's not. But once again, you need to take into account all those papers that are uh, rejected right away. So these are average figures, but they're not realistic uh, figures. Now, uh, before I move on to the next slide, I would like to uh, ask you if you have any questions or any comments about this, or, we, or, or even to share uh, experiences that you have had when submitting papers to um, specific uh, journals, or you don't need to obviously mention the name of the journal, but where you have to wait for a long period of time and you felt frustrated. Uh, is there Anyone who uh, has experienced that kind of uh, thing in the past? Nobody? Well, I can share it. I can share my own experience. Um, I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm not pressurized to publish as, as I was 20 years ago, right? Or 25 years ago, as many of you may be. Uh, now, uh, so now I'm in no hurry to publish. I publish enough articles every year. You know, the, the Spanish system uh, means that you have to publish a number of articles per year and every six years, your research output is evaluated. And then on the basis of that evaluate individually, it's not like uh, the REF in the UK where the whole department 
of the whole unit is assessed. In the case of Spain, Italy as well, we are assessed individually. And that uh, will impact your, uh, your teaching hours, your salary in a very small manner, but your salary as well. And a number of things as well. You, know, you can, you can uh, become a PhD supervisor. You need to have a couple of, uh, of I think it's two period, two six year periods in order to supervise uh, PhD students and so on. Now, I don't, I don't have that uh, problem anymore, right? So I'm in no hurry. However, two years ago, three years ago, I submitted a paper to a journal. I will not say the name. And um, about 14 months later, I was still waiting for a, a, a report or two reports or something. I wanted, I want, just wanted to hear from uh, uh, the editor. Um, no news. So after 14 months, I said, okay, I've waited for a long period. Now is, is the time for me to contact them because otherwise this, this particular piece will outdate very, very quickly. So I contacted the editor. The editor never replied. I contacted the editor maybe three times, four times, four times five times, and I never got a reply. From the editor. Now, uh, as you can imagine, I got very angry. I was really incensed, uh, incensed about this situation because, as you know, you cannot, you're not supposed to submit uh, uh, your paper to another journal unless you have heard from the first one or unless you have withdrawn the paper from the first one. Now, um, I wanted to, su to uh, submit my paper to another journal, and what I had to do in the end was to contact the publishers themselves and say, listen, uh, I cannot cope with this anymore. I'm not going to accept this situation anymore. Uh, the editor does not reply. I'm gonna, I want to withdraw the paper from the system, so please do it. I will uh, submit this uh, article to another journal and I want to have at least an email from somebody saying that it has been withdrawn. The publishers in the end withdraw, withdrew the paper. They promised that the editor would contact me uh, in the coming days. Uh, they never did. This kind of frustration, uh, is something that unfortunately does happen in, in, in the business. Um, um, and I, I can sympathize with that. And, um, and because I've experienced that kind of situations in the past, I try to avoid it. And I know that most of my colleagues, my, the other editors, we normally in touch with each other uh, and discuss some of these issues. We normally try to avoid these kind of situations because it's very frustrating for uh, authors, especially for the younger, uh, authors who are not familiar with, with the system. Now, notwithstanding this, of course, the process that you have seen here that have, I've, I've been explaining to you still stands and, and you cannot change it and it requires time. So um, very often you would expect uh, a reply within say three, four months and sometimes it might take uh, longer. Now my next slide moves to something a little bit, a little bit different uh, and it's uh, to give you an idea of you know, the number of papers and where they come from uh, in, in perspectives. I know that the situation is pretty similar in other journals. Uh, as, as I said, we are um, we're normally in touch. You know, the editors of uh, the major journals are in touch with each other. We recently had a meeting, a Zoom meeting, about 20 people joined that meeting and we discussed some of these, uh, some of these issues. So this is perspectives, but it can apply to any of the other uh, major journals. So by, uh, to give you an idea of the, of the acceptance rate uh, per country or per region, we receive uh, papers from about 40 different parts of the world, uh, countries or regions. Um, and this, these are some of the uh, perhaps more, more interesting figures. Figure, uh, China, sorry, is by far uh, the country that submits the most, uh, the highest number of proposals. Uh, is, is 11 accepted papers, 70 rejected papers. The acceptance rate, uh, rate is about 40%, 14%, 1-4. Um, Hong Kong is treated differently and uh, we uh, accepted two uh, over the past 12 months. I'm talking about the past 12 months, not the past year. Um, and that changes from, you know, I check it tomorrow and it will be probably different or next week or next month. Um, three accepted, so Hong Kong is 40%. Of course, uh, the number of, of papers is, is negligible to, to make a, a valid comparison as we, as we were. Case of Macau, uh, two papers accepted, one uh, rejected, about 67% uh, uh, acceptance rate. Now, you may think that um, this is, this is um, 
this applies to maybe China, Hong Kong, Macau, the Asian, these Asian areas. But of course, if we go to other countries, it's, it's pretty much the same. So submissions from Australia, um, English speaking countries, uh, three accepted, eight rejected. Uh, acceptance rate is between China and Hong Kong, 28%. The United States is very similar to China, uh, although the number of submissions from the United States is much smaller, five uh, rejections, one uh, accepted paper. Now, why do we get fewer papers from uh, a country like the United States? There are a number of factors. One of them is that China is much stronger in terms of uh, master's, master's degree programs. Uh, there are about 250 in China. There are many, many, uh, there are fewer in, in the United States. Translation is not that important in the United States. And also requirements for uh, academics in the United States are also quite different. In China, uh, academics are expected to publish in uh, SSCI uh, journals, whereas in the United States, this, this can, can vary. You know, monographs, uh, book chapters, and so on are also equally valid. Now, uh, islands, uh, I I wanted to give you a figure for Ireland as well, since uh, you, the organizers are based in Ireland. Uh, two accepted, uh, one rejected, uh, so 66%, very similar to that of Macau. Uh, Korea, another East Asian country, um, three accepted, three rejected. Now, you may wonder about Spain, uh, since this is the country where I'm based, uh, this is my nationality. Uh, you may think that I'm a favor of my colleagues. Well, the answer is not really. As you can see in, in the figure uh, right now, four accepted, six rejected. I don't actually, my rejections are always based on uh, referees' reports. So even if I wanted to accept them, I, I, I wouldn't and I couldn't. And I, I don't think it's, it's obviously ethically acceptable. But the figure shows that uh, the treatment for Spanish scholars is pretty much the same as for everyone else. And um, Iran um, is one of the countries that also su submits uh, a large number of papers. Uh, quality tends to be rather poor in that case. Uh, 20 rejections, one uh, accepted paper in the past 12 months, that's 4.7%. Uh, but also if we go to uh, a country like Norway, we don't really get very many uh, submissions from uh, Nordic countries. Uh, we got one in the past 12 months, and that paper was uh, rejected. So it has nothing to do, as, as you can see, with uh, the nationality or the region where uh, the, 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 the actual, the actual um, academic or the authors are based. This is another important thing. We're talking about where uh, the, the authors are based, but of course, in many cases, uh, the nationality is, is not is not where they're based, right? Uh, in Australia, there are quite a few people from uh, China as well, in the United States, from all over, and so on and so forth. Now, um, I don't know whether you want, again, to make any comments or questions. I will like to give you the floor if you want. Nope. Okay. All right, uh, I wanted to mention a little bit uh, the next, we have three more slides. And um, the next two, to talk about a little bit about this publish or perish policy, and um, which is which is becoming a, a problem really in, in most parts of the world, particularly in countries like China, uh, Spain, Italy, Europe in general, um, United States, Canada, where, uh, you know, have this, this doctrine, Moser call, calling a doctrine according to which the destiny, our destiny, depends exclusively on success in publishing work in certain uh, outlets. Um, so recruitment, promotion, tenure is determined by this publication uh, record. Uh, he says, judge by quantity and quality. I, I would even uh, change this a little bit. And sometimes it's not even quant quality, it's more Quantity. Sometimes, when uh, you look at the publication record, uh, or when um, you know you're asked to participate in in hiring committees in some part of the world, you realize that uh, um, in those traditions, they're not so much interested in the quality. You're not even asked or expected to read the material that is presented. They would ask you to consider where that material has been published, and in fact, 
in, in countries like Italy or Spain, uh, as I said before, uh, scholars have to publish a certain number of articles in, in, in highly run uh, periodicals for promotion purposes. And in countries like China uh, and the United States, if you're hired uh, in, a, in, a, for, in, in a particular institution, they may expect you to publish one or two articles in specific journals. And if uh, you don't uh, publish in those journals, your uh, contract may be terminated. Uh, and, and then there is all this pressure to publish in these in this particular journals. And that's why sometimes uh, in, uh, in, in our journals and perspectives, uh, at the end of the year, of a specific year, I get emails from uh, colleagues in the UK asking me whether if they submit a paper uh, and it's accepted, whether it can be assigned to an issue uh, in perspectives before the end of the year. And that's because the ref period is about to conclude, right? Uh, what I say in this case is, is no, impossible, uh, because we, we normally work in with long periods. So right now, most of 2021, most of the issues for 2021 are already um, finished, finalized. So I've already assigned papers to most of these, uh, of these um, uh, journals, all these, all these issues. And so that's another problem, another issue that you have to uh, take into account when you're, you're thinking of submitting uh, your, your work to uh, one of the major journals, that this waiting period, not just the processing part of it, but also the assignment to a specific issue. If you need your paper to be assigned to a specific issue, that can take even longer. So once it is published, it is available online. In some traditions, this is acceptable. As long as, as it is published online, that is fine. In other traditions, it is not. And you need the, the article to be assigned to a specific issue in a specific year. And just yesterday, uh, I received an email from someone in Poland asking me about this. The article is available online, but I would need to know when it will be published, when it will be assigned to a specific issue. Um, and I, went, uh, I, I said at the beginning, you know, there are a number of, of reasons why uh, oh yeah, yeah. Before I move on to the example, uh, there is something else I wanted to mention, and this is specifically addressed at the younger scholars. Um, because of this uh, pressure to publish, uh, we have seen this emergence or emergence of what we call predatory journals. Uh, there are companies that are out there to make money out of uh, young scholars. Sometimes even more seasoned scholars are well as well, and they would offer you the opportunity to publish in a very fast uh, manner. So you submit your paper to us, you pay $400, $500, it will be refereed within two days and published within two weeks. Uh, and this is uh, something that uh, uh, I always say, you have to be particularly aware of these journals. Try, try to avoid those journals because they will do more harm than good to your career. They will be more harmful than anything else. We don't have to go the, the, the time into, uh, into, this, into this, but if anyone is interested, uh, I can provide more information about this, this particular issue. Um, uh, you know, you just drop me a, an email. And um, I wanted to finish this part of the session with an example. Uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the session, I said, okay, we reject um, 200, 250 papers almost directly. We have to do it because we don't, we cannot contact, if we receive, imagine, we receive 400 uh, papers every year. We would need to contact at least 800 people. Uh, uh, and then you think of targets and you think of the translator and you think of meta and you think of blah, blah, blah. So all these journals are trying to find uh, colleagues willing to refer papers for them. We cannot do that, it's impossible. Right, and that's, what, that's why it becomes so uh, problematic to find referees, and that's what makes it, the whole process much longer. So we have to make decisions, uh, very snap decisions when we receive some of these submissions. Some of these uh, decisions are easy to make. Uh, and that would be an example of a paper that I rejected uh, this, uh, very recently, I think this week or last week. And, um, you know, that was, these are three sentences uh, that the author used at the very beginning of the paper. And once you start reading something like this, you say, okay, there's no, no need for me to continue because I know where, where it's going, you know, nowhere. So 
the, the point, the aim of this article is to go beyond Filma's language. Uh, the second point was to overcome the binarism interlinguistic intersemiotic. And one of the things uh, they planned to do was to use X, I don't want to, um, uh, I, want to you know, I want to hide the, all the information that I can here. Um, um, what did you use? This person, uh, this particular uh, scholar or the work by this scholar as one of the few scholars who understand texts involving more than one semiotic level. And then, and then I decided, okay, I, I cannot proceed with this. It's not necessary for me to go on uh, with this particular paper. Uh, can anyone tell me why? And with that, we will almost move into the uh, second part of the session where you can ask questions or make comments. Can, you, can anyone help, with me, uh, help, uh, help me out and say, okay, you, when you rejected this, pap uh, this paper, you did the right thing. Hi, Roberto. Um, people are writing things in the chat box. Um, uh, let me see. Let me see because I don't have it. Um... Yeah, I think it's at the top of your screen. Um, and then right, uh, as I said before uh, to you, James, I don't. I would normally use Teams. I'm not yeah. <laughs> uh, very familiar with Zoom. Okay. Maybe it's, maybe it's best to wait until the end and then deal with all the questions at once. Yeah. I yeah. Uh, has anyone replied to this? Uh, um, not yet. Uh, they, uh, so Jane says, um, is it because that this is not adding anything new, but simply reiterating points? Okay, that's, got... that, that, exactly. That's one, one thing. <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, Akkad says, um, the objective of the paper is not clear. Also, the methodology is not indicated. Okay, that comes later anyway, but... Uh... Uh, you know, this, this, this is a special section on methodology, uh, but before even we move into methodology, there, are, there are two basic problems here. Uh, those are the only few comments that I'm seeing just now about this. Okay, uh, you see, the time, they're trying to go from uh, beyond film as language, but of course this has been done. I mean, we're talking about audiovisual translation. Audiovisual translation has been there, has been there for, yeah, the paper presents truisms, okay, fine. Yes, Karen says, little, little to do with translation. Well, in fact, later it does have to do with translation. But, uh, you know, it says, my, my, the aim of this paper is to go beyond the film's language. But of course, this has been done over the past 20 years. It's, not, it's nothing new. And the reference, the main reference that the author wanted to use was 2003. So it's almost 20 years old. And you have all this bulk of publications where authors have been dealing with film not merely as language but also looking at all the other elements all the other factors that can influence a translator's uh, decisions so uh, th that's why it was rejected it was not really worthwhile refereeing so i didn't want to um, uh, you know to invite somebody so, uh, very often if we are dealing with a topic that i'm not familiar with uh, i will invite a referee just to make sure that i'm going to make the right decision and the referee will say, why on earth did you send this to me? It's obvious that this is rubbish, okay? Um, so if I, no, I'm not sure, I will contact referees to make sure, but if I'm sure, I will not. Uh, we don't have enough people ready, willing to uh, review papers for us. Okay, um, I just finished with, that was just example. So uh, I will finish with this, thank you and, and good luck. And of course, we can now have a look at the questions and I will finish with this view, uh, the last view that I took of the mountains before we went into lockdown here in Spain uh, a month ago. So James, shall we go to this uh, chat or and have a look at some of these questions? Yeah, good idea. So uh, let's, okay, let's just stop the PowerPoint and then, um, you should be able to see in the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I can see them on the right hand side of my uh, screen now. So, um, hello to everybody. I can see, uh, yes, names that I recognize. Okay, hello, Biner. Um, mm -mm -mm. Okay, uh, main manuscripts. What are the main reasons why manuscripts? Uh, this is, okay, this is a very general. Um, this is about a very general question. Uh, I've, I've just given you one example. So if we can see that the, the kind of research will not provide 
uh, readers with anything interesting or anything new or anything innovative. We tend to ask for uh, something innovative. And you may say, okay, but you, not every single paper can provide, can rediscover the wheel or reinvent the wheel. Of course not. Uh, but what we don't want is reiteration of something that uh, somebody has already said, not once, but maybe twice, three times, four times. Uh, so there must be something new in it. Other reasons why, why we refuse the, uh, we reject the paper immediately. Believe, believe it or not, language issues. Um, sometimes authors don't realize how important uh, language is. Most of us are not native speakers of English and we tend to be flexible in that sense. So as long as the paper is written in accept, acceptable academic English, it reads well, uh, communicates, puts across a message, uh, that, that would be fine. But you would be surprised, what, you know, the number of papers uh, that you start reading and you don't have a clue what the author is trying to say, okay? And not, not necessarily uh, from, you know, from China or from uh, Italy or from, sometimes even uh, native speakers are not able to convey uh, the, the ideas or the arguments that they want to, to, uh, to convey in their papers. That could be another reason. Um, uh, our language, no, we only publish in English. You can discuss uh, any language pairs. So um, say Chinese and Japanese, right? But the, pub, the, the paper, the article has to be written in English. And if you use uh, examples, um, but obviously we don't understand because I, 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 may, I may understand uh, it, uh, Italian or French, but I don't, I don't understand Chinese. So you would need to back translate to provide gloss, gloss translations of your examples. Um, just how not to exclude scientific projects which are important from the scientific. I'm not quite sure that I understand this, this question. So uh, I would move on to the next one. And if uh, Tatiana wants to clarify, um, I would be happy to answer. Is there any correlation between frequency and quality of an... <laughs> That's a tricky question. How can I, How can I answer that? <laughs> between frequency and quality. I don't think that... that I don't think there is a, uh, necessarily a correlation between frequency and quality. No, not necessarily. I think um, but this is this is really a very general question, and this is something very private. I mean, I'm just going to give you my my, my personal impression. I, I guess that some people might need more time um, to, uh, you know, even if you if you are part of a project and you're working with that project and you have you have the data and you know what you want to say, some people need need more time to organize their ideas and. and it's probably more difficult for some people than for others. So that doesn't mean that there is a, a, a correlation between frequency and quality. Some people might need more time to uh, write a paper, to organize a paper. What I, what I usually do now that I can do it, that I can, I, I can afford it because I don't have uh, you know, this pressure on me, is I have, I write a paper, I finish my article. I have one here, right? Yeah. It's finished, I finished it too. Uh, two months ago and it's been sitting on my desk for two months and maybe after Christmas I will go back to it and I will reread re it uh, and then I will probably make changes to it. Uh, sometimes when I go back to articles that I've already written uh, I say I have no clue whatsoever what I mean by saying this. So when I was writing it it was clear in my mind but three months later I don't know. So I have to rethink uh, what I was, uh, you know, what I wanted to say, what I meant in that particular uh, part of the article, the argument that is not clear enough for uh, audiences or for other readers who might not be familiar with this particular topic. So uh, depends on. I think you got, you have to find a way, the easy way for you to uh, to work. For me, this this way works because uh, then I can uh, identify issues that I, I try to correct. That doesn't mean that I will correct them. Uh, recently, um, you know, I submitted a paper to another journal before the summer. Um, the paper had been sitting in my desk for two months. I reread the, pa I reread the paper, uh, made changes and submitted it. And then I came back with a major revision. I was disappointed, uh, of course, 
Uh, but then I, I read some of the other comments and they, I thought, well, they are absolutely right. Uh, to me, this is clear. Uh, the argument is clear, well, but probably uh, not for other readers because they're not familiar with this particular topic. So I've been working on that, that specific paper for, uh, for a month now. So I don't think there is a correlation as, as such, no. Mm. Legal translation models. What do you mean by that, Majid? I'm not sure. Legal translation models. There are some questions that are unfortunately, uh, I cannot really answer because I don't have enough information there. How do you select referees? Yeah, this is good. This is good because um, you, you, need, you need to realize that I will not, I will not just, we have this system um, where whenever a paper is submitted, then um, we, we decide that this is worth refereeing, it has potential. And the system will provide us with 30 possible, 30 potential referees. And then you look at the list and you say, okay, they are experts in translation studies, but they're not experts in this particular topic. So uh, very often what you have to do is to try to find someone who is an expert in that topic. Uh, sometimes it's complicated uh, in some sub areas, the number of people available is, is very small, but at least one of them needs to be a specialist in that particular uh, sub area. Otherwise they will not provide uh, you know, solid reports for, for the, the writer to revise the paper if uh, need be. So we always try to find specialists on that particular uh, area. Um, now, sometimes we also try to find professionals. So uh, there were a couple of papers on uh, translation in museums, and we, uh, in those, for those papers, I tried to uh, find professionals, so people who actually work in museums, and see what they think of, of what uh, academics are saying, because that can provide insights uh, that we as academics don't see. And that, that is also working well, but we don't have very many of those professionals wait, you know, waiting or willing to referee papers because you have to realize that this is unpaid. So all the editorial work that we do is unpaid. Uh, it's on top of everything else if we have the time to do it. Um, now, describe here specific to... Um, Right, someone is asking, are the processes described here specific to Benjamins or uh, apply to other TS publishers? Now, we're talking about um, journals. I was talking more Tyler, Taylor and Francis. Uh, they are the publishers of uh, Perspectives, but it, it will also apply to John Benjamins, yes. So all the major journals are either published by are, um, uh, John Benjamins or Taylor and Francis. And uh, I referee papers for the other major journals as well, for Target and Meta uh, and so on. And it's very similar. It's a very similar uh, procedure. Um, for example, I've been recently contacted to refer a couple of papers on news translation because uh, I, I specialize in news translation. So my colleagues, my, the editors of whatever and whatever contacted me to refer uh, a couple of papers. Uh, so the process, yes, is very, very, very similar. Um, gosh, I submitted a paper, uh, a paper to a journal about one and a half years ago and never heard anything back. I have made a request to the editor. Well, I have, um, I have, I can't, I've given you my, my personal experience. Um, I, I got really frustrated when after one, I think it was 14, 15 months, I, I never heard from the editors. Uh, so in that case, I, I had to withdraw the, the, uh, the article and I submitted it to another journal and it was published, it's now published uh, in Across Languages and Cultures. It was published last year or, yeah, last year. So uh, in that case, I would say if you want, if you, don't, if you don't hear from them, you may want to withdraw the paper. And in my case, I even had to contact the publishers saying, listen, I don't want to uh, have any problems in the future, I want to officially withdraw uh, the, the article from this journal. So th this is the only thing I can, I can say in this, in this respect. I know that in other traditions, for example, in China, they, um, if you submit a paper to a Chinese journal, if you haven't heard from uh, the editor 
after three months, uh, you have to assume that it's been rejected. But that's in China. Uh, not, not, of course, in, in, in Western journals. Uh, here, you need to have some sort of feedback or you need to have rejection uh, a message before you can resubmit or submit it to another journal. Um, I submitted a couple of poems in translation to a journal, he said to me. But never, well, Himashi, I have no, I'm not sure about that. I don't know what, what I can say about that. Uh, in, in the case of, uh, you know, perspectives or the Taylor and Francis journals, and also in the case of uh, uh, the Benjamin's translation study journals, what we do once the paper has been accepted, uh, it will be available online, even if it's not assigned to an issue, even if it takes long before it's assigned to an issue, it will be available online. So it's there for everyone to see. I don't know what, uh, you know, what uh, journal you're referring to, so I can't really um, give you an answer on that. Uh, Luth M asks, what about academia? I'm not sure what uh, she means or he means by that. I sent in an article a couple of years ago. It took a month to hear from the editor. An article on that and uh, they would find two referees from that moment. It took, it was accepted and then about a year. Of, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. This is something that, yes, this, this uh, Patricia Gonzalez uh, has, has shared with us. This can actually happen and it's happened, uh, it happens in perspective as well. Uh, if we're lucky enough to find the referees uh, that are willing to accept um, and your paper is, you know, is a good paper to begin with, within five, six months, say, perhaps it's a, it's a bit too optimistic, but within eight months, nine months, uh, it can be published. Yes, definitely. Um, Patricia, uh, I don't know what, right, everybody, which publisher is mostly to multidisciplinary issues. I can't tell you about that. Uh, we publish, um, we, pub we are a general uh, we, sort of a translation studies journal like Meta or Target or the translator. So we publish a little bit on everything. So everything from audiovisual translation, uh, interpreting, uh, bibliometrics, literary translation. Um, so we do deal with, we do publish papers that take uh, an interdisciplinary stand. Um, so we do that, but we're talking about discourse analysis, you would have to, I'm afraid, Majid, look somewhere else. Right, Letty, thank you. Um, Paul says it's a mad, mad world. Yes, I would agree with you, and it's getting madder by the minute. Uh, so they were publishing them, and then they, then nothing. Uh, uh, Roberto, uh, we're yeah. very nearly out of time. Okay. So can I ask you to pick one last question that you'd like to address, and then one last question? Uh, okay. Um, let me see. Maybe. Um, I don't know which one. Oh yes, um, this one perhaps about uh, plagiarism. This is a big issue, right? Right, uh, yeah. Now, we, we do have uh, a couple of um, programs that we can run to see if uh, an article uh, has been plagiarized. Um, and we have come a, a couple of articles where that was the case. Um, and I have to say that in, 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 a, in one case, it was quite surprising because it wasn't. It was not uh, a young, uh, a young um, scholar. It was actually a, a full professor. I will not say from where. <laughs> yes, I can see faces. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, that was that was very uh, tricky. And uh, in fact, they, 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 the person didn't uh, didn't want to accept that we would not. That that was a big issue, and uh, we rejected the paper and we let the person know about the reasons. Uh, within two weeks, uh, they had submitted another one. Uh, and uh, so by that, uh, by that time, I was, I was really um, 
Now, how should I put it in a nice way? Pissed off. <laughs> and, and I said, and I said, listen, I don't know whether you have not understood uh, what I meant in my in my previous message. message. Uh, please do not submit any more papers to uh, perspectives. And uh, um, unfortunately, I will have to share uh, this with the editors of other major journals because this is this is really a serious issue. It's a big problem. Um, there might be other cases where it, it might be more difficult to detect, I'm afraid, because some, uh, that people are getting more and more um, intelligent. Uh, and what they do now is sometimes they paraphrase uh, uh, what other people have written. But we have another case where uh, so an author took an article that had been published in our journal, in Perspectives, and changed, um, I think it was English, you know, it was uh, sort of, uh, an empirical study with a number of people with 40 students or something or 50 students so we change english by whatever nationality right uh, and english language by whatever language and the rest was exactly the same right and it was published in another journal now the author that published the the the, uh, the article with us was really uh, angry as you can imagine but of course there was nothing we could do because that was originally published in Perspectives. We had done nothing wrong with it, uh, and that was fine. So our advice in, this case, in that case was you need to contact the editor of the other journal. But then, of course, she told me, yeah, but the, the editor of the other journal is one of those predatory journals based in Nigeria. The author was blah, 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 totally unknown person, didn't exist. Uh, so what can you do in that case? Nothing, I'm afraid. We do our best to avoid uh, plagiarism in our journals, uh, in my journal, but also in the other journals. Uh, but it's becoming, uh, we're becoming a sort of policeman and I hate that, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, James. That was my Thank you so much. And it's a shame that we have to end this, uh, this very interesting talk on, on a kind of low note, but it's a very serious one and um, mm -hmm. Uh, especially when you think about how the field is developing it's yeah. things don't stay the same for very long so right. um, i'd like to thank you so much for this talk thank i've you. done such a lot and i can see that the the chat is uh, still alive with uh, um, questions posing questions and and having comments as well so um Thank you, thank you once again. And to, to everyone who's joined us today, I'd like to thank you for, for joining us. And please I ask you as well to, to please join us for future events. We, as I said, uh, we run many of these, um, these kinds of talks from the uh, Trinity Center for Cultural Translation throughout the year. You can find us on, uh, on our website, which is you should see on the screen just now, and also on Facebook and Twitter. And if you really enjoy uh, this kind of event, you could also consider becoming one of the friends of the Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation, which means you get to hear about these events sooner. And there are a whole host of other um, perks associated with that. So please do check out the web page that you can see on your screen. Uh, and with that said, I'll thank you, uh, Roberto, once more. Uh, it's really, really wonderful to hear from you. and. Um, I hope that we'll be able to invite you to Dublin in person before long. And uh, um, I look forward to seeing everyone again very soon for one of okay. our. Thank you very much, James. And also thank you all the people who um, have joined us today. It was great to have you with, with us. Uh, and also if you're more interested in some of my reflections, you can, you can uh, have a look at uh, this article that I mentioned that was published in, in Perspectives precisely on publishing and translation studies. If, if it's not available uh, for free for you, just contact me and I will send it to you. There's no problem. Okay, thanks Thank very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you bye soon. Bye.